Welcome to the Alien Beer Podcast. I'm Chrissy Garrison, and I will be reading my science fiction stories to you. The Multiverse Blues, Chapter 5, I Believe I'll Dust My Broom. This episode finds Jules and the others in Hope's crew scrambling after an unexpected turn of events with Smiley and his men, and then on to New Louie for their concert in Gammaverse. When I started the Multiverse Blues serial, I made sure I had at least a couple of episodes written and recorded before they aired, giving me a cushion of time to work on the next episodes so I wouldn't fall behind. Given the current situation of pandemic lockdown, you'd think I'd have even more time to get ahead of things, right? Wrong. I've been working my day job from home, so the only extra time I've gotten has been from not commuting and not socializing, other than the occasional Zoom meetup. When I've had downtime, i found myself sapped of energy, not feeling as creative as I needed to be. So, this episode is a bit fresher than usual, having been written and recorded within a week of the broadcast. I have the next one started, at least, along with plans for where it's going after that. Chapter 5. I Believe I'll Dust My Broom. Dribbler, I cried as I struggled to my feet. I scanned the lot, squinting through clouds of dust and debris kicked up by the explosion. My new friend was nowhere I could see. As the fiery mushroom burned out, I could see even less in the dimmer light. Babs darted off back the way we'd come. The dust and dark swallowed her whole. Jasmine the cat bounded after her. Hush, hissed Harlan, leaping from the ramp to the ground beside me. Get down or move. You're a sitting duck and giving away your position with your damn fool shouting. Gonna get you killed. Maybe me with you. I was about to argue with him, but I was cut off by a shot in the darkness. I threw myself to one side, away from Harlan and the ramp. I stayed close to the tour bus until I reached its near end, away from La Esperanza's floodlights, but still in the bus's shadow from the parking lot's orange sodium light. A gust of wind pushed a wall of dust and smoke away from me, and I spied a crumpled figure on the pavement about fifteen feet away from me. I'd need to venture out into the open, but if it might be Dribbler, I'd have to take that chance. Hunched low, I crept out into the lot, step by step toward the body. Every nerve in my body sang out an alarm, knowing that I made a fine target to anyone not in the dust cloud. My heart thundered in my ears, and my eyes stung with tears from more than airborne grit. All the while, I struggled to rein in my rasping breaths. Despite all that, I almost let out a yelp of joy as I realized that not only was the form on the ground my new friend Dribbler, but his chest rose and fell as I reached him. I patted his face and whispered his name in his ear. Dribbler, are you okay? Wake up. We have to get you out of here. His skin was clammy to my touch, his face pale and wan. Dribbler groaned and coughed, but his eyes remained shut. I pulled open both eyes and saw that his pupils were dilated, but unseeing. I had a terrible dilemma. Since Dribbler was likely in shock, I knew I shouldn't try to move him. But if I left him here, he could get shot or he could get worse without better care than I could give him. Another gunshot ripped the air not far away from me, lighting up the smoke with its flash. That decided me. I hooked my hands under Dribbler's armpits and dragged him back toward the ramp. Halfway there, he groaned and convulsed and vomited. I had to stop to turn him onto his side and cleared his airway of my fingers. As I tended to Dribbler, running feet skittered gravel as someone smallish rushed past me. Some meaty thuds from somewhere in the dark told the story of a fist fight, followed by the scrabbling of feet and the sound of another body hitting the ground. I redoubled my efforts to move Dribbler. We made it nearly to the edge of the cone of brilliance cast by the bus's entry floodlights when Jasmine leapt into my path and hissed. I stopped more out of reflex than anything. Jasmine and I just stared at each other, each breathing hard for a long moment. She shook her head, then turned to look back behind her towards where I'd last seen Harlan. After a few heartbeats, I felt the need to move forward, but Jasmine kept blocking my path, warning me back with a low growl. I pleaded with her. Jasmine, Dribble, Dribbler's hurt. I have to get him to the bus and get him medical attention. The cat shook her head once more, then the floodlights went out, plunging us into near darkness. Jasmine disappeared, leaving me free to continue dragging the big guy. 
When I reached the ramp, Marcy ducked out from underneath it and helped me pull Dribbler inside. In the now dark interior of La Esperanza, I said, I think he's in shock. Does anyone know more than just first aid? Marcy's whisper came from close to my ear. Hope does. She has medical devices, alien technology. They can help heal him, I hope. Just then, footsteps clattered on the stairs and Babs fell to the floor next to me, gasping for breath. Are you? I began. More shots barked outside, and a couple pinged off of the bus's hull. Jasmine leaped into the cabin, followed by Harlan, who landed heavily. He called out, Zamboni, lock us down and get us out of here. Zamboni replied over the intercom, I will comply. The hatch pulled shut and the engine whined as I had to grab onto Dribbler to keep him from sliding around the cabin as the bus swung in a series of tight arcs. Light from outside slanted crazily as we passed street lamps at high speed. I heard another ping of a shot ricocheting off of La Esperanza's skin, and then all fell quiet. Hope appeared by my side, holding a frisbee-shaped device. The device's underside lit Dribbler's pasty face with a warm yellow glow. Dribbler took in a deep breath and let it out in a gust, and some color returned to his cheeks. The bus's interior lights flicked to life, and I found myself and Dribbler in a circle of faces. The whole crew seemed to hold their breath, watching Hope work. I turned to look at Hope as she worked. I had more or less decided on my own that she and her people were descended from porpoises or other cetaceans. Her glossy, smooth, gray skin shone in the dim interior lights. Her enigmatic black eyes focused on Dribbler. She wore a filmy green gown that appeared to be damp, like it was fresh out of the washing machine. As I sat within a foot of her, I couldn't help but notice the alien beauty of this creature. This person, I corrected myself. Hope glanced over at me, and my face burned with embarrassment. She'd caught me staring. She favored me with a smile filled with little pointed teeth, then returned to her work. Her tail swished behind her and brushed my ankle, and somehow that made me feel a little better. Harlan broke the silence. Get any of them? Babs replied. Think so. Winged them, at least. I looked up and around the cabin at the crew and asked, What was that all about anyway? Were they trying to kill Dribbler? Babs and Harlan exchanged a look, then Babs answered, Maybe, but they wanted us to bring that Trojan horse bomb on board. I think they were trying to kill us, Chica. Fuckers, whispered Dribbler, his eyes open a slit. I should have known better than to deal with Smiley. Ms. Davenport crossed her arms. You didn't know. Your contact told you. My contact? growled Dribbler. Set us up. He tried to rise, but Hope pushed him back to the floor with a gentle three-fingered mitten hand. Hope hummed a smoothing tune and sang to Dribbler, You will be okay, my dear, but you will need to rest. Dribbler's eyes fluttered, then his face went slack as he fell asleep. Hope glanced at Marcy Davenport and Babs, and then at the couches, and the two human women nodded and picked the big guy up and laid him there. Jasmine slinked her way from the back of the couches to onto Dribbler's chest, where she curled up and joined him in a catnap. Thanks for the warning, Jasmine, I said to the cat. Jasmine's ears pivoted toward me, and her tail flicked acknowledgement. Hope stood and sang to the rest of us, Sleep is healing, sleep is good, we all need to get some, and St. Louis is hours away yet. Rest well, my crew. Before I could ask more about the bomb and the attempt on our lives, the crew followed Hope's suggestion and headed to quarters. Hope remained by Dribbler's side. Though I was sorely tempted to keep vigil with her, fatigue caught up with me all at once. I climbed the stairs and collapsed in my bunk, falling to sleep almost instantly. I awoke to a rapping on the door to my quarters. It took several repetitions before I had any idea of where I was or how I'd gotten there. Everything after that I'd left the wedding seemed like a dream, down the rabbit hole after a cat with my ring. Peach-colored light filtered in through the curtains over my window, and I had the strangest impression that I saw a medieval stone tower slide by outside. Tap, tap, tap. Coming, I said, running fingers through my hair, hoping that bedhead looked cute on me. I stood and opened the door and found Dribbler grinning at me. Dribbler, you're awake? He nodded. And I'm just fine, thanks to you, sweetie. I hugged him. My face smooshed up against his chest. His arms engulfed me. 
You'd do the same for me, I murmured, not knowing what else to say. He let me go and nodded with enthusiasm. You bet I would. I owe you. Anyway, we'll be in St. Louis in a few minutes. I thought you might want to look around before we get too busy. Wait, wait, I protested. It was night. How is it morning? St. Louis isn't that far away. Dribbler shrugged. I guess Zamboni took the long way around to confuse any goons that might have followed us. And I think we stopped for a while somewhere, too. Not sure. I've been out. Did, I began uncertainly, did Hope make us go to sleep? Dribbler shrugged. Hope's singing voice can be pretty persuasive. I think it was more of a suggestion than anything. Anyway, I trust her not to abuse that power. She cares about everyone. Yeah, she does seem to be good to you all, I said. Dribbler shook his head. No, dude, not just the crew. Everyone. Hope cares about everyone. I followed him downstairs, and we found the others eating biscuits off of a tray. I picked one up and took a bite, discovering it to have cheese and bacon baked into it. Marcy handed me a lidded cup of coffee, which I sipped with a great enthusiasm. I put aside worries about any blisters that might occur on the way down. I noticed that Hope had not yet joined the rest of the crew. Marcy held a clipboard and pen, her hair tied up in a bun. Today she dressed like a disco librarian, wearing a lime green jumpsuit with blue and yellow diagonal stripes, with cat eye glasses perched upon her head. Okay, we're playing the new Louis Coliseum. They supply the power, but we have to supply the amps and speakers. A whole Coliseum? Where do you keep speakers like that on at La Esperanza? I asked. Dribbler touched my shoulder and said, Remember, my world got knocked back pretty far in the 60s. Any buildings here older than about 40 years were put together out of rubble. This isn't like the field house or the stadium in your Indy. It'll hold a couple thousand tops. Acoustics are fantastic, though. Marcy went on, I'd rather not leave the bus unintended, so someone's going to have to work lights and sound, and someone's going to have to work security. Which do you want, Jules? I frowned. A couple thousand people, and there's no security? She waved her pen in dismissal. Oh, they've got their own security for the premises, along with box office and all that. I mean, someone's got to have the bands back, especially after that bomb attempt. I nodded. I can do either, but I have more experience with working boards than cracking skulls. Ms. Davenport smiled as she wrote something on the clipboard. You're turning out to be a good investment, Jules, my dear. That works for me. I have more than tasers up my sleeve anyway. Jasmine, are you willing to help me out? The cat yawned and stretched, then trotted over to Marcy and rubbed up against her ankle and nodded with a mert. Thanks, buddy. She really saved us last night, I said. We might not have found the bomb in time if not for Jasmine's nose. The cat preened, giving herself an impromptu tongue bath. Babs scritched behind Jasmine's ears with a fond smile. Oh, we know we can count on her, Jazzy. She's very clever. After a few more minutes of coffee, biscuits, and conversation, the bus pulled to a halt. Marcy touched a panel, and the winds became somewhat less opaque. Outside, there appeared to be a row of rough stone buildings set along a smooth concrete street. People meandered up and down sidewalks in their suits, hats, and face masks. Hands on the clock tower across the way from us showed the time to be about quarter past nine. Wow, I slept in later than I thought. Ms. Davenport handed out plain white filter masks to each one of us. The ramp and stairs wind and descended to the street below. I strapped my mask on and found the material allowed me to breathe much more freely than I expected. She said, the masks are more of a, for social interactions than actual danger, but the air is worse here near to Old St. Louis. Dribbler added for my benefit, Old St. Louis is a crater, a lake in the Mississippi now. The worst washed downstream decades ago, but better safe than sorry, you know. We filed down the stairs and around to the back, where Harlan had opened and rolled out the rear ramp. We stood at a loading dock where we were met by a stocky woman in a yellow floral business dress with a matching mask. Her ash blonde hair fell in a thick French braid all the way down her back. Ms. Fox, I can assure you, said Harlan, we have no curse words in any of our music, nothing sexually suggestive for this show. Hope don't like that none anyhow. Hope's tour is about uplifting music, and music that'll make you cry, but in a good way. Hmm, that's Mrs. Fox, if you please. We don't get outlandish folk playing here much, so I'll have you know it's only by that reputation you describe that we've allowed this off-world rock and roll show. See that your talent sticks to that reputation, Mr. Harper. Harlan's brows formed thunderheads, and his face reddened a bit. 
Now, see here, ma'am, Marcy interposed herself. That will be fine, Mrs. Fox. We'll be looking forward to playing the Coliseum. Its reputation is what drew us here. Very historic, very full of civic pride. With a warning glance to Harlan, she added, It will be an honor to play here. Mrs. Fox regarded Ms. Davenport for a long, tense moment. Then she extended a gloved hand to Marcy. Marcy accepted. Very well. Rebecca Fox, director of the Coliseum. Marcy Davenport, Hope's tour band manager. Just then, Jasmine skittered into our midst and yelled. Babs tensed and studied the cat. I turned around to see what had Jasmine so spooked. Protesters marched toward us, men and women carrying signs that said, Fishy go home, and no aliens in New Louis, and float off, deviants. Thank you for listening to the Alien Beer Podcast. If you like my stories, please visit my website, sillyhatbooks.com. I publish as E. Chris Garrison, and my books may be found in paperback, ebook, and audiobook format on Amazon.com and other places. A podcast where three horror authors discuss monsters? It must be Wondering Monster Roll Initiative! Uh, I feel like once you put the mask on it... Uh... It's, once you put the mask on it, it's a monster? Please rise for his yeah, dishonor. Nope, the... Judge of the abyss. That's the difference. Fed his pig at the table of suffering. You brought... You brought, you brought, you brought the Whomping Willow? I brought a goddamn kaiju. <laughs> we'll see you every Monday. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.